Happy Wednesday, everyone. Uh, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. Uh, you know what day it is. It's Tennessee Harmony Day. It's the day before Thursday. It's the day after Tuesday. It's the day that it feels like there's some light around the world, particularly here in America. Everyone's reacting to uh, the Virginia election, uh, the governor's race where Glenn Youngkin won, Winsome Sears won, and now the whole world looks different. And boy, do I have a take on all of this uh, that will be my fire starter, and we will work this fire uh, for about the next hour. Uh, Leonidas Johnson's in studio with me. You guys have seen uh, Leonidas before. He's back. Leonidas, uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, Leonidas, a young man from Ohio. Uh, he and his wife, and uh, you got three kids or four? Four. Four kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, live in Ohio, and Leonidas is back uh, to help us uh, fan these flames and these fires. We'll bring in uh, Shamika Michelle as well. Uh, we'll go out to North Carolina and help her fan these flames because I actually talked quite a bit uh, today in the Firestarter about uh, three lovely ladies over at MSNBC. Uh, and so Uncle Jimmy will come on. We'll have an approval rating on Winsome Sears. And uh, we'll do some Tennessee Harmony. Uh, Pastor Bobby and Pastor Anthony are out uh, this week. They have a uh, convention going on with Renew.org, uh, but we have a fill-in minister, uh, Jason Hauser. He's going to join us, and he'll be an interview uh, that we'll do uh, for Tennessee Harmony. We'll talk to him about fatherhood and discipleship and parenting, and maybe a little bit about Justin Bieber and uh, his marriage, because Kind of surprisingly, Jason Hauser has a take on Justin Bieber and his marriage. Well, maybe a little Kanye West and his uh, Sunday services that included Justin Bieber and Marilyn Manson. We'll get into all that with uh, Jason Hauser, a renowned uh, minister who works with families and creates music for families and is kind of an expert on developing a family and parenting kids while in a family. We'll talk with him about all of that. Uh, but. We'll start where we always start, with a fire. And boy, do I have a blaze that I'm excited about because I think people are missing the boat on what happened last night and what's happening in this country. And I think I have the explanation. And I think people on both sides. I've heard a lot of talk about, oh, you know, we don't need Trump anymore. That's what this proves. And uh, you know, people on the left you know, obviously have their theories on uh, what happened last night? This was an explosion of racism. Racism just reared its head again in the state of Virginia. I got a different take. So uh, let's get to it and let's get the conversation going. Oh, but before I do that, before I start the fire, I need you guys to start scratching the wood together by hitting that subscribe button at youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Hit those likes. This fire that I'm about to start, this explanation I'm about to give you about what really transpired last night is worthy of 5,000 likes. It's why you're a member of the Fearless Army, because I tell you things and explain things to you that others tell you six months down the road. I'm telling it to you now. I'm going to make you the smartest person at your dinner tonight or at your dinner this weekend, or when you discuss this with your friends over the next few days, you don't have to give me credit. You can repeat everything that I say uh, right here in this fire story. You don't have to credit me. I'm just gonna make you look and sound smart. I'm gonna make you sound like a man who's fearless or a woman who supports fearless men and is just as fearless. So, all right, let me get to this fire. Last night, guess what I did? I watched MSNBC's election coverage. It was anchored by Rachel Maddow, Joy Reid, and Nicole Wallace, people I call the Mo, Shikari, and Shirley of the Alphabet Mafia. The three stooges of sexual identity, racial identity, and gender identity presented a portrait of American reality far different from my interpretation. 
In their view, critical race theory doesn't exist and certainly isn't being taught in American schools. An investigation into Thomas Jefferson's worldview is a high priority. January 6th was a violent bloodbath that nearly toppled our republic. And Virginia's gubernatorial race was a referendum on reinstituting Jim Crow laws. The picture painted by Maddow, Reed, and Wallace likely explains why Republican Governor, uh, Republican Glenn Youngkin won his race for governor and why he'll be joined in office by Republican Lieutenant Governor Winston Sears, the first black woman to win a statewide election in Virginia. It's difficult to retain and sustain power with lies. The political left and their propagandists and the corporate media have been lying nonstop for the past year. A wise con man conceals his lies with occasional truths. Politics attract con men, both left and right, moderate, conservatives, liberals, con men, all of them. That's what politics attracts. The problem for the left is big tech and its social media apps convince Democrats to be unwise, to abandon truth completely. Big Tech believes its Twitter and Facebook algorithms are in control of truth. Youngkin and Sears believe in a much higher power, a truth spelled out in the Bible and backed by the blood of Jesus. Listen to this sampling of their beliefs and what's driving them. Friends, I am pro-life. <laughs> And I cannot believe where this governor has taken us. A child made in the image of God. And then we're gonna decide whether that child lives or dies. Folks, this is not the Virginia that we all know. And I will stand up for the unborn and you will stand with me because if we don't, I don't know who will. Friends, I believe that we are all formed in the image of our maker. And therefore we are all equal. And anything that teaches division is not of him. And therefore, we will not teach critical race theory in schools. We will not. If you see grandmother with her head uh, under a sheet, because she would pull it over, that was her prayer tent. She was very instrumental in everything I did. My campaign is really based on the, the Psalm 133, verse 1. And what does that say? How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in peace and harmony. This is America. There's nowhere else to run to. And people run to America for liberty and freedom. <sighs> yeah. Uh, Democrats and their pundits will spend the coming days and months trying to figure out how the state of Virginia elected President Joe Biden by a 10 point margin and 12 months later elected Youngkin and Sears. They will, of course, blame racism, Donald Trump, the Proud Boys, Thomas Jefferson, and eventually they will shred Democratic candidate Terry McAuliffe as a horrible candidate. They will not admit that voters rejected their reliance on lies. They will not admit that Twitter and Facebook baited them into believing that lies supported on the social media matrix could be converted into real world truths. Not just comedian Dave Chappelle, Ordinary American citizens are snapping out of the woke coma induced by Twitter. Listen to Chappelle. When Sticks and Stones came out, a lot of people in the trans community were furious with me, and apparently they dragged me on Twitter. I don't give a because Twitter's not a real place. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Twitter's where the Three Stooges go, to have their lies confirmed. On social media, you can earn likes and retweets pretending that January 6th was the modern day Pearl Harbor. Yesterday, Nicole Wallace claimed police were maimed by flagpoles during an insurrection. Listen for yourself. I think we know the answer to some of this. I watched Glenn Youngkin's interviews on Fox News and he did nothing that Claire's, he did not. I mean, he worshiped at the altar of Donald Trump on Fox News. He flew an insurrection flag at his rallies. He simply didn't 
He played dumb about a, 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 a Zoom rally. He did not really put much distance between himself and Donald Trump on the big lie or the deadly insurrection in which police officers were maimed by flagpoles. So I think that the, the real ominous thing is that critical race theory, which isn't real, turned the suburbs 15 points to the Trump insurrection endorsed Republican. What do Democrats do about that? <laughs> the deadly insurrection. The truth is a bunch of frustrated taxpayers at the behest of FBI informants staged a mostly peaceful protest inside the Capitol. An incompetent police officer shot and killed a tiny non-threatening woman, Ashley Babbitt. In comparison to the riots, looting, and arson we witnessed across the country in the summer of St. George Floyd, January 6th was a 1950s-style sorority panty raid. On social media, you can, gain gar you can garner likes and retweets, firing off tweets claiming that 2021 America is no different from 1921 America. Late last night, as it became an evident that Youngkin would win, Jamel Hill tweeted, it's not the messaging, folks. This country simply loves white supremacy. The tweet has 16,000 likes and nearly 5,000 retweets. Hill thinks she's tweeting hard truths to power. She's just running to Twitter to get her insanity and lies confirmed. I'm sure Joy Reid did the same thing after ranting on TV that Republicans are a danger to national security. I'm not kidding. Listen. They would have to be willing to say what you have said on your show. I think we've all said a version of it. You have to be willing to vocalize that these Republicans are dangerous, that this isn't a party that's just another political party that disagrees with us on tax policy, that at this point, they're dangerous. They're dangerous to our national security because stoking that kind of soft white nationalism eventually leads to the hardcore stuff. It leads to the January 6th stuff because if people are tolerant of it in your party, they're tolerant of the soft racism, mm. it's a really short trip to get to the January 6th insurrectionist place. Although and we're not- I would love to hear Joy Reid explain the soft racism that she peddles and did it play any role into what we saw all of the summer of 2020? We saw buildings burn, when we saw policemen shot, when we saw stores looted, when we saw nonstop rioting across the entire country. All of it, far more violent, devastating, destructive, worse than anything that happened on January the 6th. But somehow, that's not a threat to national security, but Republicans are. Is Winsome Sears, Sears, uh, Sears, is she a danger to America? She immigrated to America at six years old. She joined the Marines before she was an American citizen. She's Lieutenant Governor of the state of Virginia. She's black, so is her husband, and so are her kids. Are they all a danger? Does she sound dangerous here? I want to introduce to you my husband, Terrence. <laughs> Marine. My daughter, Katja. And, and my other daughter, Janelle. I'm telling you that what you are looking at is the American dream. The American dream. When my father came to this country, August 11th of 1963, he came at the height of the civil rights movement from Jamaica. He came and I said to him, but it was such a bad time for us, why did you come? And he said, because America was where the jobs and the opportunities were. And he only came with $1.75, $1.75. 
took any job he could find and he put himself through school and started his American dream. And then, yes, and now he's comfortably retired. And then he came and got me when I was six years old. And when I stepped on that Pan Am Boeing 737 and landed at JFK, I landed in a new world. And so let me tell you this. I am not even first generation American. When I joined the Marine Corps, I was still a Jamaican. But this country had done so much for me, I was willing, willing to die for this country. That's a threat to national security. Winsome Sears, Republican. Black woman, black husband, black kids. Threats to national security. The Three Stooges over at MSNBC argue that Republicans have constructed a fantasy world, an unfair political terrain that makes it difficult for Democrats to compete Republicans have constructed a fantasy world, but Joy Reid is arguing on TV after everything we've seen in the past two years, that some people in moose hats and flags that went to the Capitol, and there's only one dead body at that alleged insurrection, and it was a white woman, tiny little woman, that was shot and killed by police. They're the threat to national security. You got buildings burning all across this country throughout all of 2020. You have policemen shot. We've had carjackings of American citizens. We, we've had all kinds of violence, looting, arson, in virtually every major city because St. George Floyd died. But Winsome Sears and Trump supporters that uh, went into the Capitol at the behest of FBI informants and about half the Capitol Police Force that let them in, they're the threat to national security. Who's living in a fantasy world? I mean, let's think this through. Take the race out of this. Quit looking at, thing, at everything through a racial lens or a political lens and just examine it through a truthful lens. Who has really been a threat to the security of this country? The facts are crystal clear. This isn't me caping up for Trump supporters or anybody. Just look at the facts. Just do the death toll. Do the damage toll. Billions of dollars of destruction over St. George Floyd and Jacob Blake. And damn, Congress was back to work within an hour of this alleged insurrection that threatened the sanctity of the United States of America. They were back working in that building. I guarantee you that damn Wendy's that they burned down over Rayshard Brooks, I wonder if it's back up and running right now. But within an hour, they were working at the Capitol and somehow it's, it's Pearl Harbor. Who created the fantasy world? Nicole Wallace argued that schools are not teaching critical race theory. She backed Terry McAuliffe's lie that the state of Virginia was not implementing critical race theory into schools. 
Yep. And what is happening in sort of Republican America, it's not just critical race theory. It's it's saying, you know, fraud happened. The people believe there was fraud, so they're fixing it. So, right. so Republican voters think Republicans are fake. Never mind that it's fake. That's right. Critical race theory isn't taught. It means something different to voters. They think it is. So Republicans are fixing it. Youngkin's going to ban it. And some of it is just a question for Democrats now. Do you adjust to a terrain that is not fair, that is not just, that is That's all right. fact-based, but that at this tonight looks like it advantages Republicans? Well, the way that you you, the way that you confront and defeat an, an opponent that has framed things in a way that is fake is that, yes, you can create your own competing fake framework and run on that, or you can accomplish real things and then run on that and say, yes, you, these guys have invented a boogeyman about a, a form of, 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 of racial hierarchy that you've fantasized into existence that isn't actually taught in schools. But look, you have a child tax credit and you have the biggest climate change legislation that's ever been passed in this country. And we have an infrastructure bill and all of the terrible traffic problems in Virginia are going to get fixed because Republicans are talking about fantasy stuff and Democrats are talking about real Who has done that? <clears throat> For those of you that have any faith in God, any, just a tiny bit, just a a ask yourself, these lies that are being told nationally, on TV, constantly, and you're buying into an assault on the truth is an assault on God. When they get you living in this fantasy world of lies, they've taken you straight to hell. These women are sitting up on TV talking about they're not teaching critical race theory in schools. We've sat up and watched video after video of parents reading from the text that's being taught in these schools at school board meetings, they're quoting verbatim what their kids are being taught. We've heard from parent after parent, oh my God, they started having school on Zoom and I got to hear what the teachers were telling my kids. And it's straight critical race theory. These lies are just too easily debunked while serving as governor in 2015, McCollum's Department of Education explicitly directed public schools to embrace critical race theory. On the Virginia Department of Education website, it recommends critical race theory. It, <laughs> I'm, I, I hate to say it because it, it's somewhat <coughs> hypocritical and stupid for me to say this, but you can find these lies, you can figure these lies out just over, over Twitter. You ain't gotta be smart. Just punch it in. It's all, it's everywhere. There's a string of tweets from a guy, Christopher Rufo, that debunks all of it. The left and those of you on board with the left, those of you that have thrown out every religious belief you've ever had to support the political left. You've moved into fantasy land. You've abandoned the truth. You now support lies like men are birthing people. Men can have babies. You support, Biden appointed some dude, Richard Levine, who changed his name to Rachel Levine and Allegedly, Rachel Levine made history as the first female four-star admiral. This is La La Land. This is hell on earth. This is an assault on fundamental truths. Do you think God thinks Richard Levine is a man? and the first female four-star admiral? Do you honestly think this lie they've been telling for the last decade that the police are a bigger threat to young black men than gang violence? And that, oh my God, I can barely go out of my house. I could get hunted down by the police. 
you honestly believe that? Yes, it may win you a debate at work. Yes, it may make your boss feel sorry for you on your job and maybe guilt trip into giving you a raise or a promotion. But do you believe it? And all these little short term victories and yeah, it feels good to tweet this out and in a text string I can say this and I can point to George Floyd or Jacob Blake and Eric Garner and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. I can point to them and say, oh look, we're all under attack and the police are doing this. It's a lie and you know it. When you step out of your house, and if there's a policeman down at one end of the corner and the Crips and Bloods at the other end of the corner, you damn well know which direction you walking. Quit lying. It's satanic. George Floyd is a hero. Cut it out. Biological men should be allowed to compete against women in sports. Cut it out. The only way to survive COVID is with three masks, six vaccines, and in constant isolation. Cut it out. The world the Three Stooges believe exists is on Twitter. It's a satanic world where the truth is under constant attack. Virginia voters live in a different world a world that answers to a higher power than Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg. Hats off to the people of Virginia. Thank you for providing people starving, thirsty in the desert, a cup of water, an ounce of hope. That we're all gonna shake out of these lies and quit living in this fantasy world that they have created. People ask me all the time, oh, J Jason, you, you never criticize the right anymore and you sold out and you're a Republican and blah. If y'all would quit lying, maybe I would have an opportunity to criticize something conservatives or, or Republicans did. But I'm not blind and I'm not stupid. I'm not going to live in a fantasy world created by the left. I'm not going to participate in this attack on truth. It's satanic. You stack lie on top of lie on top of lie on top of lie. Of course it's going to collapse in. You can't lie forever. Again, all politicians are con men. A good con man is going to slip in some truths to justify his lies. If you can't see these people on the left, it's straight lies all the time. And I'm not having it. And those of you that co-sign for it and go for it, you're liars too. And you're satanic. You don't know it, but you are. Sitting up, <laughs> Planned Parenthood and aborting babies at a record pace, and you're good with it, but you also think God is good with you being good with it. You sitting up in church, and the whole message is about, we gotta be more inclusive. We gotta be more inclusive. So let's abandon what's taught in the Bible and just sign off on it to be more inclusive. Because that's what Barack Obama told me. You have sold out God to serve your political beliefs and to try to glom onto a little bit of power. And to make sure you're good with Twitter and Facebook, and no one ever says a harsh word to you because you had the balls, the manhood or the womanhood to stand on what you were taught in the church. You ain't man or woman enough to stand on that, 
So you just drop it all together. God needs fearless soldiers willing to deal with the consequences of standing on the truth. That's why I keep saying hats off to the people of Virginia. They rejected the lies. And you're going to hear a bunch of conversation over the next few months about all, what this is all about and what this signifies and how we got to adjust this message and that message. No, you got to tell the truth occasionally. This is about a house of cards built on lies that collapsed in 12 months. And if you want to sign up and be a part of the alphabet mafia, man up and woman up and do it. But quit, pretend, quit pretending you standing with God when you standing with them. Before I bring in Leonidas, I'm going to tell you about my good friends at Good Ranchers. Uh, with the holiday season around the corner, <laughs> don't bring mystery meat shipped from overseas into your home. Get food sourced from 100% American farms right here in America. Be the hero your family needs by ordering from our friends at Good Ranchers today. With them, you will get the highest quality, better than organic chicken and beef that's been grass fed and grain finished, and it can be shipped safely to you in individually sealed and seasoned packages. You can get all this at half the price of their online competitors. You get the steakhouse quality you deserve at a price every family can afford. Go to GoodRanchers.com to buy now. Subscribe today and save 20% off on each box of mouthwatering meats. Subscribing brings the cost down to less than $5 a meal. Plus, right now, get an additional $20 off and free express shipping if you go to GoodRanchers.com fearless or use the promo code fearless at checkout. That's $20 off and free express shipping at GoodRanchers.com fearless. Know where your meat comes from. Know who you're supporting. You're supporting Good Ranchers. You're supporting people and a business that supports your way of life, your worldview. Good Ranchers is fearless. If you want to be a fearless soldier, if you want to be a part of what they started in Virginia, pushing back against the, these lies and deceit and the satanic movement and the critical race theory, hop on board with the Fearless Army, hop on board with supporting sponsors who support us and support things that are good for America. GoodRanchers.com slash fearless. Use the promo code fearless. Do it today. That's your small way of pushing back. I need you to hit those likes button and the subscribe button on youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. I need you to leave a comment. I need you to sign up for the Fearless Army. I need you to tell your friends about what we're doing here. We're trying to raise up real men and women to keep this momentum going that started last night in Virginia. We got to push back against the lies. Leonidas, I'm sorry. I, I, Knew I had a rant I had to go on. I didn't know it was going to go 30 minutes, but. I love it, though. Uh, I love it, though. <laughs> uh, it's great. I'm over here like, yeah, man. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, I ran it for 30 minutes. I, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes or a few minutes to, or as long as we need. What was your takeaway from last night? Man, I'm, I'm just going to build off what you said. And yeah, something James, Lin, James Lindsay, who's, who's also been with Christopher Rufo as far as the spearhead against critical race theory, he, what he calls it is the iron law of woke projection. And I, I don't know if he actually coined that term, but I love it. Iron law of woke projection. Iron law of woke projection. And what happens is, is these, these people that embrace the woke ideology, they tell them themselves. So anything they accuse other people of, you can guarantee that they are guilty of doing that themselves. So when they, they accuse you of racism, you can bet that they're pushing that racism behind the scenes. They accuse you of uh, living in a fantasy world and pushing fake stuff. Iron law of woke projection every time, every time. And it's, it, 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 it's so ridiculous because uh, the, the one six uh, being compared January to 6th. January 6th, being compared to 9-11, uh, all the stuff that you said about the gender stuff, the critical race theory, I mean, it, 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 it all fits. And I don't know if you've ever heard of LARPing. Have you heard of LARPing? No. Like live action role playing? 
<laughs> so, I'm so co- okay, cosplaying. Have yeah, you heard cosplay, of cosplay? cosplaying? Yeah. So it's kind of like that. And like people, people uh, dress up as these characters, right? And they go out and they and they uh, basically reenact stuff from like a video game or a, t- a TV show or something. And they pretend to be those characters. And I've said for a long time that that's what we're seeing in our society, especially with the race stuff. People like uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, uh, the, the way that they approach race and they approach the race conversation, they're LARPing. They're trying to don the costumes of uh, you know, the, the people that actually went through that stuff. The people back in the, in the 50s and 60s who went through the, the civil rights movement and they actually dealt with that stuff, they're putting on that costume and pretending like, yes, I am Rosa Parks. I am going through this, this kind of oppression. And that's what we're seeing, I think, with the, uh, the whole push that Literally, I'm white gonna supremacy. You, I'm gonna give you another one, because what even when they don't put the costume on, they put that costume on other people. Yeah. George Floyd is Medgar Evers. Right, exactly. George Floyd is Martin Luther King. <laughs> exactly. And ignore the fact that he's drugged out on fentanyl, he's been a violent criminal, he's, other than those last nine minutes, no one can, no one can identify what he did other than porn and crime, mm. uh, what he did to push society forward. But let's dress him up as Medgar Evers. Let's dress him up as Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Let's turn him into a martyr and a hero. Right. That that's some high class LARP. It's that, like that yeah. It's that emotional. It's, it's that emotional manipulation because there's an emotional connection to that stuff, right? Like, and and they know that people will have an emotional response to it. So if you can tie those two things together in people's psyche, then they're going to have the same emotional response to George Floyd as they would have to Medgar Evers, uh, had they lived back then or had they been alive back then. And that's that's what's happening. It's that emotional manipulation, psychological warfare. The other the point I wanted to make was there's something called the Mott and Bailey fallacy. The who? The Mott and Bailey fallacy. Mott and, and Bailey. That it comes from uh, back in medieval times, there was a Mott and Bailey castle. And the Bailey was like this, uh, this, this little, I, I don't know, you wouldn't even know what you would call it. It's just this little area that wasn't very fortified. It, it was very difficult to defend. Um, the Mott was much more, for, it was a fortress. It was up on high ground, very fortified, uh, much harder to break into. So when the army would- uh, Gated community versus projects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so when an army would, would attack uh, and the Bailey was lost, they, all the people would retreat to the Mott, okay? So the way this works is people will push an extreme position, critical race theory. They'll push that uh, white people are inherently racist and racism is endemic in society. Some extreme position, that'll be the Bailey. And then when you challenge them on it, they'll say, no, 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 critical race theory isn't being taught. We're not teaching all of that stuff. They'll retreat to the Mott and they'll say that, no, we're just teaching history. We're just teaching history. You don't want us to teach the real history of slavery? Is that, you, don't, you don't want that? And, that's, and once you recognize that, you'll see it everywhere because they do it with everything. I'm gonna give you an example of what you're talking about, Mott and Bailey. I don't know if we have the clip. I, I, I know I saw it last night. At some point, uh, Joy Reid, who I love to call Rachel Maddow, uh, <laughs> but Joy Reid retreated to, away from critical race theory, to saying, white people just don't wanna know who Thomas Jefferson was. And so it's really not about yep. critical race theory. It's about who Thomas Jefferson was. Like that's the actual argument. Like, we're, like not only is that the argument, like that's a priority. <laughs> like in 2021, right. I, in order for me to experience success in America, joy in America, pride in America, I have to go all the way back and reassess who Thomas Jefferson was. Right. That's the priority. And if our kids don't know who Thomas Jefferson was, if we don't know that he owned slaves and uh, laid up with, with, with a, a slave or whatever, or fell in love with one, if we don't know all of that, how can they function in this modern American society? I, and we're going for it. This is what just 
that these, they have a platform and influence and that they would roll these three clowns out as this is our election coverage. The queen of sexual identity, the queen of racial identity, and the queen of feminism. That's how we're gonna present a, their point of view is how we're going to uh, present and portray America. And I can't, I mean, <laughs> I'm just, let them have a seat at the table, but y'all need to build a bigger table. Could we at least get a man, a heterosexual one, somebody with a Christian worldview? Could we, could we, could they get a seat at the table to say how they perceive America? Does it have to be the three stooges of the alphabet mafia? They're the only people who can explain America? Again, people, I just don't understand how a tiny percent percentage of America has all the say so or most of the say so or a disproportionate amount of the say so. It, 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 can, can anybody else get a word in edgewise? And I guess they said, well, you can watch Fox News or you, you can watch CNN. But I, I was blown away watching this last night and and. It was a wake up and it was something I needed to experience because I don't want to live in an echo chamber. I, I don't watch a lot of cable news. I, I, I watch yeah. Tucker Carlson's opening monologue most nights and that's pretty much it. Yeah. And, and, but, but last night I wanted to make a point. Like I want, to, I want to know, I had a feeling what was going to happen in this election and I wanted to see how the left perceived it and covered it. I wanted to hear from them for an extended period of time on what they thought of about America. And it's just, it's a completely awesome. different view and experience that, that, that I'm having or even friends of mine. And I know people that think they're having that experience. Yeah. But I'm trying to, t that's not the experience you're having. You're not stepping out of your house worried about the Proud Boys. You're just not. just not. There's no Proud Boys in your neighborhood. They're not there. And if they are, they're in hiding. They have no influence over you and your success and or happiness or safety. You're not afraid of the police. This whole, and, hey man, do I don't think white people are any more biased prejudiced or racist than black people. Mm. And so do I hear black people, including myself, saying inappropriate things from time to time? Hell yes. And so that's why I don't, when they say inappropriate things from time to time, <laughs> I just keep it moving. It's, it doesn't, it's not stopping me from getting ahead. It's not, and, and I don't need kids taught to hate this country, to hate themselves, to hate their ancestors, to hate their parents. I don't need them to do that in order for me to have success. So I don't need critical race theory. And I don't blame right. parents in Virginia, white and or black, from saying, hey, cut this out, man. I don't want this purple haired, a woman that, that's supposed to be teaching my kid two plus two is four, I don't want her pushing her worldview on my kid. Two plus two is five is what she would be teaching. <laughs> and that's, that's not even a joke. They, they're actually teaching that. Like two plus two can't equal five. But it just, it, it just shows how effective the manipulation is because you can tell somebody that the sky is green and they can look up and say, uh, it doesn't look green to me. They say, no, the sky is green. OK, and then they go and they say the sky is green and they repeat those talking. So even if it goes directly against their experience and what's happening in their life, they will they will go along with what's happening in the media. Like I said, it's psychological manipulation. Now, you said something important, I think, about the critical race theory, and that was um, it's a worldview. And that's really what it is. It's it's not a theory. It's not an academic theory. It's a worldview. It's it's. 
implementing a way to filter the world. And, and you're, you have this certain lens and it's, okay, I'm gonna look and see everything through this racial lens. So this conversation we're having right now, we're gonna view that through a racial lens. Uh, if I go out and I have a conversation with, uh, with a white person and uh, maybe it's positive, maybe it's negative, I'm gonna view it through a racial lens. It doesn't matter. Even if the conversation has nothing to do with race, even if nothing, if race never came up, Everything is viewed through that lens. And this is what critical race theory is. And what people need to understand about critical race theory is that it has two components, Jason. It has an academic component and it has an activist component. So when we talk about the worldview, uh, it's being taught in colleges and these college students are getting that worldview. And so when people say it's not being taught in public schools, they're technically correct because that worldview is not being taught on an academic level. In public schools, it's being implemented. The worldview is being applied. It's praxis. So it's not critical race theory, it's critical race praxis. So they're not, I mean, we, we know kids aren't reading Delgado and Bell and, and Kimberly Crenshaw. They're not having their textbooks laid out in elementary school. Like the teachers are just coming in and ha they have that worldview already and they're filtering their entire lesson plan through it. So when they say, again, it's the Mott and, Belly, Mott and Bailey thing. When they say it's not being taught, that's technically correct, but they're just retreating to the Mott and trying to make it seem like they're not actually implementing critical race theory in schools. I, I love that point that it's being applied, yeah. which probably is worse than it being taught. Yes. Uh, because yeah, absolutely, a child, and I'm gonna take, I'm gonna give a twist on your word, applied, it's being imposed. Imposed. And that's kind of what you do with kids more than anything, you impose things on them. Right. Now you're gonna eat these. You're gonna eat these broccoli. I don't care if you don't like it. You're gonna eat it. It's what you need. Blah blah blah. And your kids buck up against it, but it's exactly what they need. You force it on them, and it's good for them. They are imposing a worldview on kids because even if you tried to teach it, it's beyond most of their kids' ability to grasp. Yeah. But it's also dangerous to try to teach it because you could get some pushback. Yeah. In terms of, there may be yeah. some kids smart enough to go, well, hold on, man, my daddy, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's far more dangerous and effective to impose it, apply it, uh, build, construct systems, and, and a worldview around that. I, 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 I love that point, and, and I think it's a very accurate one. Uh, and so, I get, last thing before we, we'll get to Shamika in here and get her take, but what, what's your take as it relates to, because there's a lot of conversation about what last night says about Donald Trump, mm. the Donald Trump impact. I'm someone that believes and have said this previously, and I mean this in a non-offensive way uh, to Donald Trump and his supporters, but I really believe Trump has served his purpose. Yeah that he's caused us to have a conversation we needed to have. He's enlightened us to the level of corruption and who has sold out America. He's made the point about China and he's opened our eyes. But I do think, and I've said this privately, I've said it publicly, and I think Yunkin is an example of it. The way to move the country forward right now is with politicians who can authentically wear their faith. Yeah. And I think Winsome Sears can authentically wear her faith. I think Yunkin wore his faith effectively throughout this campaign. I don't think when, when, when Trump tries to put on the faith deal, I just don't think he wears it comfortably enough for people to buy it. And, yeah. and so, I don't mean it in any disrespectful way, but I think when Trump is more out of the way and the left is just forced to defend its lies, they just, when they can't hide behind Trump, 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 right. Trump, and have to actually defend the things that they're saying and doing, they can't do it. Right, they go straight to racism or sexism or whatever it may be. Uh, my take on it though, I mean, it, 
I, I think that the dynamics are similar to 2016, uh, where Trump was elected into office. But not that, not that Youngkin is Trump, but just that people, and this is something the Democrats just have not learned, and they continue to miss this lesson, but that people just, they push back against those progressive policies. They're not racist, they're not xenophobic, they're not sexist, they're, they're not all these things that the progressives label them, they just do not like the progressive policies that are being pushed and uh, and you know the McAuliffe comes out and he says that parents don't have a right to have uh, you know to control their children's education I forget the exact quote but it, that's the that's the paraphrase but he comes out and says that uh, on both sides of the aisle parents are their, their ears are going to come pick up because they're going to say well, wait a minute that that's too far that's too much, and they're gonna push back against that. And instead of having some introspection and looking inward and thinking about like, okay, maybe our policy, something's wrong with our policies, maybe this, this isn't as popular as we thought it would be. Instead of doing that, they, they go, they push racism and they push, you know, like white supremacy on like, oh, this explains it, this is why. And like, like Hillary did, there's Russian collusion, that's why. That's what it was, yeah, the deplorables, you know how it is. It's those backwoods hillbillies. Yeah, we, we don't need to worry about them, that's, that's, that's who it was. Um, but I mean, I think that's what it is, that people are so fed up with the progressivism, I mean, people are fed up with the, the of course, the critical race theory, the education issues, uh, fed up with the transgenderism, even the vaccine stuff, the vaccine stuff's a big issue, the mandates and the, and the masking stuff going on in schools. So I, I, I mean, you look at the polling and you look at what was going on and that seems pretty pretty obvious from an outsider perspective, but then, of course, the Democrats aren't, they're just not gonna learn it, Jason. They're not gonna figure it out. All right. I need you, you, yes, I'm pointing directly to you, to join the Fearless Army. Hit that subscribe notifications button, youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. I need you to tell your friends about this show. I need you to sign up to be a soldier in this army. We're going to take back this country. All right, Shamika Michelle. I wanna be, I just wanna be, I just wanna be, I just wanna be, I just wanna be. All right, it's time for some Shamoke, or some Shamoke show. Uh, Shamika Michelle, you've heard me rant and rave here for nearly an hour about uh, last night's election and the election coverage. And, you know, when, when I beat up Mo Larry, or what up, Mo Shakari and Shirley, uh, <laughs> Joy Reid, Rachel Maddow and, and Nicole Wallace. I, man, we better get a woman in here to make sure that I'm not just being a sexist pig. Uh, <laughs> hey, who's that on the far right? Is that Nicole Wallace? Yeah. Are we sure that's Nicole Wallace? Yeah. I'm not, are we sure? Anyway, uh, what was your take on the election coverage last night and or my mono or, or just any of it? We'll just start with a vague question. What's your takeaway from last night? You know what I enjoyed most was listening to Winsome's uh, acceptance speech or her, you know, congratulatory speech or whatever. She really made it seem like that anybody can do what she did. Although she came here as a six year old immigrant, she fought her way to the top. And so I didn't feel like she was trying to be a gatekeeper, unlike uh, Joy Reid. I felt like she was saying, if you just work hard, this is the American dream and anybody can achieve it. I really appreciated that in comparison to, to Joy Reid acting as if you stand absolutely no chance in this racist country. I, I think you're a thousand percent right. I, I was moved by everything about Winsome, including her family, and and just what the the family she created, as well as the family she came from. Uh, both her and her husband, both Marines, two beautiful daughters. Uh, that to me, <laughs> that to me looked like a different a more authentic version of the Obamas uh, <laughs> than, than what we've been getting. And so 
I, I think the sky is the limit for Winsome Sears. She she could maybe end up being president or governor of the state of Virginia for sure. Well, you know, I'm not a big fan of women leaders or of them being at the tip top. So I don't know about president, but, <laughs> you know, go win some. Um, you know, I'm excited about that. And I just love that she seems so authentic. And like you were saying, she wasn't afraid to just be who she is. Whereas when you talk about Joy Reid and the other two stooges, it just really burns me up that Joy is also the child of immigrants. You would think that she would be pushing, hey, look what look what I did. I went to Harvard. I went on to become the first black woman anchor of a cable news show. Instead, this woman who has the neck of a pack of hot dogs is in is pushing that we can't do it because we're black or we can't do it because we're women or we can't do it because the white man has his foot on our neck. Like this is foolishness. Look at what you've accomplished, Joy Reid. Do you think that you're so much better than every other black person in America that you're the only one or one of the few that could actually make it or do something with your life? I don't like that. It, that really is like an elitist gatekeeper attitude and I don't appreciate it. I think you make a heck of a point. Why do you think, and, and, and Shamika, you go first, but Leonidas, I want your take as well. Why do you think Joy Reid does that? Why do you think she takes that position when her life contradicts her message? I think Joy is scared of, of sharing the stage. Why, why, why else would you do it? What, what other reason do you have? And you see that a lot with black women who just who are afraid to kind of share the stage with other black women as if there's only room for just a few. You know, I used to come home every day after school and sit with my grandma and watch Oprah Winfrey. Oprah was not the prettiest woman. She was fat. She was always struggling with her weight, but she made me feel like if I worked hard, I could do that. I felt, oh, I'm charismatic. I feel like I can hold the attention of a crowd. Maybe one day I could be Oprah. But now you hear Oprah a lot of times pushing a message of oppression, and I'm thinking, girl, I watched you for years go up and down, up and down with your weight, just struggle, not you weren't the prettiest thing, but you made it and you were an inspiration to people. And now you want to just snatch those dreams away. I, you know, I think they do it because they don't want to share the stage with any other black woman. And it's it's disgusting. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's I think that's an interesting take. I, I think there's that's probably a lot to do with it. But th it's not it's not really unique to Joy Reid and, and Oprah. You know what I mean? Uh, you, or Lord LeBron or whoever else or whether the black people that uh, that that do these kind of things that come from very little and you know raised to the highest of heights and then pretend like. Yeah, they're, they're oppressed and other people can't do the same thing. It's incredible. But it's it, it really is a mark of woke progressivism to uh, have this sort of ideology where um, everything is centered around power and control. So it, whatever they whatever they push, whatever message they're sending out has to do with whatever is politically expedient in the moment. That's why you see LeBron embrace uh, like we're pushing back against oppression and, and slavery and stuff, and then it comes to China. No, I'm not saying anything about that. And that's why, because it's not politically expedient to do so. And that's um, and and like I said, it's across the board. It's woke progressivism. They they will push things like Me Too, hashtag Me Too, uh, but then somebody comes out and accuses. Is Joe Biden of sexual assault and all of a sudden, nope, 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 we're not going to, we're not going to do that. She's lying. We're, we're going to push her away. And now, now all of a sudden we're not believing all women because it's not politically expedient. It doesn't give them the power. It doesn't give them the leverage. And if you can, you look at each issue and you look and see, does this give them political power or not? And that's where they're going to make their decision about what they support. And so I've asked you all a question that I'm probably best equipped to answer, having worked in corporate media for as long as I did. Uh, and, and so, look, 
it's a requirement to hold the job that she has that and, and there's a profile of people who get to hold those jobs. And so I think it was Phil Griffin who was running MSNBC at the time when Joy Reid first got there. I believe now there's some black woman, I can't call her name, that actually runs NBC or MSNBC. Uh, but there's a profile for hosts. And this is across the board. This is in ESPN, Fox, Sports, uh, MSNBC, CNN. There's certain boxes you have to check. And, and one of the big ones is, do we have leverage and control of you and dirt over you? MSNBC can get rid of Joy Reid at any time based off her blog posts that she put out before she was a host at NBC. And there was a lot of stuff that they deem homophobic and some stuff they would probably consider racist that was in her old blog post. And so Joy Reid knows every day going into work, man, they can get rid of me anytime they want. I'm not that talented. I'm not uh, some soup IG supermodel uh, lookalike type. And so at any time, they can get rid of me. And she knows they have that leverage, so she knows she better, she better say exactly what they believe. She better stay on message. And, but I don't, just like uh, Leonidas, I don't want to single out just Joy Reid because it's across the board. There's a, re there, there's a reason why Don Lemon has a chair on CNN. It's because one, they know Don Lemon's agenda isn't black. His agenda is gay because he's gay. And... Uh, I say it all the time. I've asked friends, I confront them and with a very easy question that most people fold and they don't know how to answer and they get scared, but it's just factual. Ask any human being which identity is most sacred to them and ask them by saying, if you could only have one, would you rather hold on to your racial identity or your sexual identity? And so for that would be me asking Leonidas, what's more of a priority for you, being heterosexual or being black? If you could only choose one, what would it be? Most people, when they answer that honestly, they'll be like me. I'd rather be heterosexual than black mm -hmm. if I could only have one. And that's because my sexual identity is a higher priority for me than my racial identity. Well, the same thing's true for Don Lemon. His sexual identity trumps his racial identity. And so Don Lemon gets to go on TV and pretend to be black and represent the black voice or black agenda, blah, blah, blah. But his real agenda and his real allegiance is to his sexuality. And so again, he's not, he, he's, he's black by looks, but what comes out of his mouth is gay. And, and his point of view is based on his sexuality. He ain't worried about how, what happens with black people. He's not worried about what happens in black neighborhoods. He don't live in one. He ain't married to one. He ain't in love with one. He ain't taking it in the boom boom room from one. It, it, it's Don Lemon don't care about black people. And he damn sure don't care about black men. So all of, I could go on to examples in other walks of life, idiots, and as it relates to us, they try to empower idiots and compromise people. People that are just smart enough to be stupid. Just smart enough to do exactly what they're told not smart enough to win a debate with an executive, not smart enough to push back against an executive in a real way that, that could have consequences. And so they empower idiots. And Joy Reid is 
I, I'm not going to call her an idiot, but she's compromised and they have leverage over. Uh, Don Lemon is an idiot and he has no interest in black people. Uh, I, I'm just going to end with those two. I could go on and maybe one day someone will force my hand and I'll start giving sports examples of the same stuff. But for today, I'm going to leave Bomani alone. Uh, <coughs> anyway, I want to circle back uh, to you, uh, uh, Shamika. My take that these lies can't be sustained forever by politicians and, and that occasionally you got to mix in the truth. And I just think the lies have become so easy to see and so their portrait of reality is so far removed from what real reality is that I think it's inevitable what happened in Virginia. I, I, I don't, I, damn, they damn near going to lose the governor spot in New Jersey as well, but I, I think they're going to hold on to it. Uh, but, but I just think it's lies and, and racism, this constant conversation about racism, racism, racism is the biggest lie that's being told. I think that's what cost the Democrats last night your reaction. Yeah, you know, they can call critical race theory whatever they want to call it, right? Like Leonidas was saying, technically, they are not teaching critical race theory. But I don't care what you call it. What you can't take away from parents is the ones that listened over the Zoom calls for the last year. You can't take away the experience from them of hearing the foolishness that their children were being taught. I don't care what name you give it or what you call it. You are not going to teach my little black kids kids that because of their black skin, they aren't going to make it. Because of their black skin, they aren't going to be anything. And I don't think it's fair that you teach little white kids because of their white skin that they're privileged or they're inherently evil. You can't take away the experience that parents have had over the last year. So you can get on TV and you can lie and you can, you know, say, well, technically it's not critical race theory or whatever. You can say that, but you cannot take away what we experience during this pandemic and listening to what our children were learning. I actually heard my daughter in a class where the teacher was telling her how pitiful black women were and how she supports uh, Trayvon Martin's mother and sends money to her because black women are, we're, we're at the bottom of the totem pole. I was so upset when I heard that, that I wrote her a nice little letter and let her know, listen, you are not my child's white savior. And I don't appreciate you trying to put this in my child's head. Just because she's black, just because she's a female does not make her oppressed, does not make her at the bottom of the totem pole. And you don't need to form a whole classroom activity around trying to make my black daughter feel better about herself. I had a, an issue with that. And I brought it to the teacher and the principal like, hold up. So you may call, say, well, it's not critical race theory, but what it is is bullshit and what is not going to be taught is to my children and you have parents that have stood up in Virginia and said no, this is not going to work. And parents across the country are, are starting to be more privy to what's happening in the classroom, the sexual orientations, uh, foolishness that's being pushed in the classroom. And you're not going to tell a parent, especially a mother who carried her child for 40 weeks, that she has now no right over what her child learns. That's not going to work. So the Democrats are going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out something else, because when you start pushing parents out of a child's life, that's when you're going to meet some mama and papa bears for sure. Uh, Shamika, that was some of your best work. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome job. Uh, we're going to get on to some Tennessee Harmony with Jason Hauser. It's my obligation on hate discrimination raising up your hands for freedom. All right, it's Wednesday. You know, that means it's time for some Tennessee Harmony, uh, where we normally talk with Pastor Bobby Harrington, 
Pastor Anthony Walker, uh, but they have a convention going on with Renew.org. And so uh, Bobby said, hey, man, I got one of my best friends, a guy that I helped disciple early in his ministry here in Nashville, Jason Hauser. They've uh, Jason and Bobby actually wrote a book together about parenting. And Jason now runs uh, a ministry called Seeds Family Worship, kind of travel the country teaching right. Christians how to parent and how to disciple their kids. Uh, but before we get to any of that, I, I got to because you've been here, you, you got here about an hour ago, you watched much of the show. I got to get your take just as a parent and what what you're seeing from parents as it relates to critical race theory and the pushback. I want to get your take on that. You know, it's amazing watching just parents in this day and age. My kids are graduating and leaving home, but like watching younger parents and all the stuff coming at kids. And parents feel like they got to be in such defense with all the things going on in culture. And I, and I just want to encourage parents to think about like being on offense, right? There's all these things coming at him in education, even the things mentioned earlier. It's like, it's amazing that government's trying to tell parents they can't tell their t kids what they need to be taught. You know, they're trying to control the teaching. And it's like, it's the parent's responsibility. And I love how you talk about the show about responsibility of parents being fearless, but to be fearless parents is to have an offense, right? To say, hey, we're gonna teach our kids what it means to have character. We're gonna teach our kids about God. We're gonna teach our kids, you know? And like for our family, just have a simple family night. Once a week, we have a time together as a family to center it around God. And so I just wanna encourage parents is like, all these things coming at our kids and all these just teaching it, just things that aren't true. My question is, are you teaching your kids truth at home? Are you teaching your kids truth? Because they're hearing these other voices, but the most powerful voice I believe, and the Bible says, the most powerful voice in our kids' lives are their parents. I may ask you a question right now that you're not prepared for, but I'm not okay. gonna apologize for it. I, I have this conversation all the time with parents and friends of mine that you just said parents are the most powerful voice yes. in, in a home. And, and uh, Jason Hauser lives in Idaho, and so it, it, but you, you lived here for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, I, I say, and I don't have kids, so let me put that into the record. Okay. Uh, but I say modern technology has diminished the voice of parents. And that, Jason, I'm 54. Okay. And so when I grew up, uh, there was two phones in our house, one in the kitchen, one in the master bedroom. And they had wires on them, cords. They had <laughs> wires on them. <laughs> Slinky was, cords on them. <laughs> there was no call waiting. And yeah. so if your mom was on the phone, good luck having one of your friends call you. Uh, there was one record player in the house. Yeah. And there was two TVs in our house. I think one in the kitchen and one in my brother's room. And, and that was it. And so my mother could sit back in the master bedroom and know everything that I was doing in other parts of the house because mm -hmm. she could hear and there was just yeah. a lot less. But now today because of modern technology and people put their earbuds in, they put their, they, have their own individual cell phones. Yeah. It's like all these other voices have direct access to kids. Yes. And so it's just more crowded. There's more competition. My mother's voice, my father, and you know, I tell this story all the time, it'd be news to you, but my senior year of high school, me and my father lived in a one bedroom, 400 square foot apartment. Wow. So when he snored, I could hear it. Everything. You know, <laughs> his That's close. Yeah, his voice dominated everything yeah. in that little bitty apartment. And parents just don't have that luxury anymore. There's intense competition for your kids to hear you. Every yeah. celebrity, whether it be Marilyn Manson, Justin Bieber, or Snoop Dogg, kids can put on some headphones and just descend into Snoop yeah. Dogg world yeah. and exit your world. H how do parents combat that? I mean, my answer to your question is the battle is real, right? <laughs> so parents need to take control of that. They're still, 
in control of their household and what goes on under their roof. And I think what happens even with technology, one of the things like in our household, Jason, like we have open technology, like our kids have cell phones, but we can check their cell phones. We have access to any passcodes that they would have. And my wife was more diligent about this, but she checked their phones and at night they'd have to put their phones downstairs. And then we would have family time. And of course we, we're a family that goes camping. We live in Idaho, right? But we'd get off the grid. But I just think parents need to take control definitely of technology. I think a lot of parents are afraid to set boundaries for their kids and it's so important. But really just uh, for parents to have a relationship to invest time in their kids. And if your kids are up in their room, like we have an upstairs in our house, I go upstairs to see my daughter, right? I, I, hey, you need to come down. You need to come down and spend time with us. And we may watch a show together, but we also play cards together. We sit around and just talk. You know, we'll literally sit around on the floor and just talk about life. And it's really investing that time in our kids, especially with teenagers. You're not gonna hang out with them for five minutes and expect them to tell you everything that's going on in their life. But go skiing with them for a day or do an activity or spend time away from technology and you'll start hearing about what's really going on with their friends and in life. And so I just think parents, the, the two words that I say to parents is be intentional. You gotta be intentional about taking control and just confront this battle and be a fearless parent to be intentional and also to engage, to engage with your kids. And just like this show's all about engaging culture, like engage in what's going on under your roof. I think one of the greatest things we can do to impact American culture is for our families at home, one family at a time. You know, I think some people will hear that and they'll say, man, uh, Jason just suggested go skiing with your kids, go camping, and people say, well, I can't afford that, or I can't, and, and I just sit there and instantly reflect on my childhood, because I grew up relatively poor, uh, you know, and sometimes really poor, uh, but relatively poor, and, and one, you mentioned just playing cards with your kids. Yeah. So my parents divorced, uh, both my parents stayed involved with me and my brother, but but when we were living with my mother, I can't ever remember a time where me and my brother said, Mama, let's play cards, where she didn't say, okay, great. Yeah, right. <laughs> and we would just, we would play cards and entertain ourselves, and, and I forget, we played this game called Speed or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I just think that parents today and, you know, as I got older, by the time I was 12, 13 years old, these uh, computer games started coming out. Yeah. You know, from Atari to Odyssey and all these other yeah. things. And, and I look at parents now and they prefer to let the computers babysit their kids rather than, and because their kids think that's funner or whatever. Yeah. I, I, how much advice do you give parents about, uh, you know, just how much time and away, putting your cell phone away at dinner and actually talking and making eye contact with me and dad or your brother and sister or your cousins or your neighbors or whatever. How important is that? It's so important. And I, I would say it's not the activity, like you're saying, depending on the financial and things yeah. you can or cannot do. It's the time. It's the time and the, it's the intention that you give to your kids. And I mean, families eat, right? We eat meals, we eat every day, we sit around, but we can get grab and go, or we can sit around the table. And there are times to linger around the table. There are times for parents, I would say, don't let your kids get up from the table quite yet. Hey, let's talk about this week. Let's come sit in the living room. And the Bible talks about in Deuteronomy six, it's like when you, we teach our kids about faith, one of the things we do is we sit at our house you know, and just taking time. I mean, it's, it's really a biblical concept to be intentional as a parent to say, we're going to sit at home and spend time together. Meals are a great idea. Like you're saying, cards, board games, um, just sharing stories, you know, and maybe, and maybe watching, you know, we watch sports together, but talking about sports, talking about our favorite teams, things that can bond us together. But then also as things happen, as we're teaching our kids about faith, we can talk about even our sports teams. Well, how that relates to God in the interview that was afterward. How, wow, he's, when I see Derrick Henry, I'm a big fan of the Tennessee Titans. And in his interviews, he's humble. You know, and we, we point out like, wow, look, he's so talented. He works so hard to be a great athlete. And then he's humble when he's in his interviews. Like we point that out as a family. And that's, for us, that's a faith moment. 
you know, so it's really, but it's really investing the time and, and speaking into our kids' lives. I do think technology, we're afraid to engage and, and our kids do push against it. But most parents that I know, kids that have phones, they pay their kids' phone bill, right? Most kids, I don't know many kids who pay their own cell phone bill. <laughs> and so I encourage parents, you're paying the bill. You have control. You need to uh, use that to discipline. It's, it's your phone, you know, and you do that in a way that's respectful to your kids, but you're still in charge of that. And that, that's healthy for your kids. You mentioned that you still watch sports. A lot of sports fans are disgruntled with athletes and the politics. What's your position on that? Or how do you, how has your family handled that? I mean, we, we just try to talk about, you know, case by case situation, you know, like, like I was talking about, you know, and I do, I, I try to point out the positive, you know, there's so many negative things going on in the world, but there's also, there's great things. There's great athletes. There's a lot of athletes that are men of faith, you know, that you can look to and, and looking at guys, both athletes and coming from the music business, but musicians, it's a, it's a difficult place. If I had to live my life on that kind of pedestal and platform, it'd be tough, right? And you'd see a lot of cracks in the vase in me. And so I have a lot of compassion for those guys. But, you know, I think with, with our kids, we try to just, we just try to engage and say, you know, that's the wrong attitude or they handled that the wrong way, but it didn't turn us off of, of sports. And I, I, I do think sports is one of the things that connects people, you know, and, and because it's become so political, um, it makes me sad, honestly, because we need things that we can connect about. And, and uh, so I don't know, I've wrestled, I'm being honest with you, I've just wrestled with that. It's just been a bummer for me to see sports was a place, especially for guys, you yeah. know, when you're getting to know a guy and you talk about your favorite teams and, and it, it turns straight to into, into political things. And it's just like, hey, I want to talk about the deeper things, but this is kind of how we can get to know each other and find some common ground. I want to tell you one of the things I find hilarious, Jason, is uh, athletes and coaches a lot of times, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but they'll start an interview by, man, I want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Without him, I couldn't have done this. And, and you'll never see a broadcaster say, well, what role did God play in this? Ask a, they'll never ask a follow-up. They just move on. Yeah. And it's like the athlete and or the coach has just told you what his whole life is centered around and how it allowed him to play at this level. But we have virtually no interest in letting him expound on that or what role. And it, it's wow. It's it, I don't know. It's so true. I, I mean, yeah. I've noticed that. I'm always encouraged when guys say that. Right. Yes. And to our kids, we point that out like, look, he's given God credit for the Super Bowl or in those moments. You we do applaud that to our kids. But then that they never get to expound. If Derrick Henry were to say, man, Taylor Lewan and the block he threw uh, is really what made me rush for 200 yards. Right. The reporter would naturally follow up and ask them about Taylor Lewan and their relationship with Taylor right. Lewan or give me next, what did he do, blah, blah, blah. But if they say Jesus, nope, next question. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they don't want you to expand <laughs> on it at all. It's all, and again, that's one, cause I, I have worked at ESPN, I've worked at Fox Sports, I've worked at, in corporate media at the highest levels. Mm -hmm. The reason why I moved to a more independent thing is because I want to be able to talk about everything. Yeah. And in the sports world, faith plays a major role. Teams pray before games, they pray after games. Yeah. The co again, and because the media won't do its job is one of the reasons why there's so many misconceptions about sports. And, and because if the media were actually explaining their jobs to athletes, I'm gonna show you out in politics how it would apply, okay. is if the media were doing its job, athletes would know, like, hey, you know who your little league coach was? The guy that was picking you up and getting you McDonald's after the game mm -hmm. because your dad wasn't around? You know he was a cop, right? Because he was there because of the police athletic league and their give back to the communities. And so a lot of the little league coaches you had were either policemen, firemen, ministers. Mm -hmm. It was conservative, people that are labeled conservatives mm -hmm. were your little league coaches who were helping you out when you were a kid. And your head coach now in the NFL, 
he, he's probably a lot like your little league coach. And so athletes, if they were properly explained to us, like, you know, they keep telling you these conservatives hate you and they're out to get you. But your experience with conservatives actually contradicts that. Yeah. They won't explain that. It's like evangelicals are the worst people in the world. And people of faith, we're, we're the worst people in the world. We're holding everybody back. When actually, particularly as it relates to athletes, it's been the evangelical who has actually sh shown you a hand. And when you didn't have anybody, he was the one taking seven dollars out of his kid's mouth and putting it in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, from a place of love. They do it for the yeah. love of these kids, right? And they've been setting that example and and really building character because that's the thing. Many of these coaches are building godly character in these kids. I mean, we've had our kids, the coaches in our kids' lives in football and basketball have been a huge influence on their faith because they've had Christian coaches and coaches that have loved them and been with them and even had conversations that's tough for mom and dad to have that they hear from us all the time. But like a coach is going to say, hey, you need to straighten up. But they're saying it from a place of love and they're teaching these kids. Right. And that's that's so needed. And it needs to be reported, like you said, the media. I mean, just report the news. I People think people die from what they don't know, man. Yeah. And we don't tell them what they need to know. That's the problem. I, the thing, I, I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but the I want to get to something very important. You mm. use music. Yes. As part of your ministry. Yeah. And I think music is really, really important. And I was glad to hear, and I want you to explain, why do you use music? as part of your ministry and as part of teaching families how to deal with their kids? Well, it's amazing. You know, we want to memorize things, right? We try to memorize facts, history. We try to memorize the Bible if you're a Christian, but it's, it's hard to memorize, just rote memorization. But we know the lyrics to thousands of songs, whether we want to or not. Maybe there's some songs from the 80s back in my mind I wish I could delete right now, but they're there, right? <laughs> and so music is powerful. God's wired us, I believe, to connect with music in such a powerful way. And so I led worship for kids at a vacation Bible school at Bobby Harrington's church 20 years ago. And the ministry director asked me to write some uh, melodies because I was writing music and to some scriptures. And so I taught the kids that week. Every kid at, at our VBS knew those verses word for word and got them in their hearts. And so that was the beginning of a ministry called Seeds Family Worship that I run. We've done 17 albums. Our newest album is called Hope. We felt like God put in our hearts to write out the scriptures of hope coming out of last year so that we have hope, our hope in Christ. Um, but music is just a way to get God's word into our hearts. And it's a way, you know, to get truth into our hearts. And so that's why we write word for word scripture songs, but they're, they're fun songs. They're more just like worship songs you'd hear on the radio or that you'd sing in church. They're corporate worship songs, but they have energy for kids. And so it's a great way for parents. Like you can listen to it in your car. You can put this worship music on. You can stream it at your house, but it's a way to help learn God's word and get God's truth in your heart. And so I've instinctively known that and felt that and believed it. I didn't really start implementing it into my own life because I was I, like most people dancing between the secular world and the yeah. real and the religious world. But man, over the last two to three years, I intentionally listen to gospel music every morning. To, mm -hmm. to, so I plug into Jesus. Yep. Amen. Every morning. And it, it, it changes my outlook and approach. It makes a difference. To, and, and, and it's like when, when those words are running through my head, I'm a much better person. Yeah. And, and, and I, my actions and stuff get more in alignment with where they need to be. And, and, and so you have smartly realized, you know, look for the positive and look for opportunities to me as a journalist, I, I, I look and see the flaws or whatever. And so I, I don't know if I'm asking you a question that I should be asking, because, again, your approach is more positive. But that's why I try to explain to people like, man, this. This hip hop music, 
that everybody's ingesting, there's real consequences to it. There's consequences to putting positive music into you. That's right. There's consequences to putting negative music into you. Yeah. How do parents understand that? Do you help parents understand? Yeah. That that like there are consequences to ingesting music that's violent, misogynist, racist. Yes. Promotes immorality. There's consequences to that. There is. I mean, I want to say one thing, Jason, off of what you said before about yep. listening to worship music in the morning, and then I'll answer that question. Yep. But, you know, I'm a musician, and every time I play in the recording studio, the first thing I do is I tune my instrument to make sure I'm in tune. And like when you're listening to worship music in the morning, when your listeners, when you, when you put on worship music or things that point you to God, you're tuning your heart to God. Like when you listen to that music, when you read God's word in the morning, you launch into your day, you're in tune, just like I'm in tune before I play with other musicians and it creates this harmony, right? And so it's such a good thing. It's a powerful thing to ingest the good. And so I, again, I'm focusing on the positive because yep. I'm a, that's the guy I am, you yes. know, but as far as uh, any, any kind of music, it doesn't have to be hip hop. I mean, there's a, some great, um, there's great music in all genres. I just went to the Dove Awards week before last and they had every genre represented, the Christian Music Awards and uh, gospel music, hip hop music, uh, rap music, you know, traditional Christian and worship music and every genre had, had value. It's, it's the words, it's the message, you know, so uh, less so than the music, you know, but any kind of music that you're meditating on you know, it does impact you. And I've listened to albums. I listen to all kinds of music, but I'm just listen to an album and I'm angry, right? But the music brought that out of me or I'm, you know, you feel that and, and music impacts us. So I, I do think it's important for us to realize that as parents, but then also as we teach our kids not to be so um, fundamentalist to just shut them down. What we've tried to do, what we did when our kids were teenagers, we'd have conversations. Why do you like to listen to this music? What is it saying? Do you realize what it's saying? We've had a family time where I took the lyrics of a song and, and dad just sat there and read the lyrics, you know, and when your dad drops the F-bomb 10 times in your devotion time, it gets the kid's attention. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm not saying, I'm just reading this. This is the song that you want to listen to, right? And let them think about and process. Again, with our kids, we, we want to come alongside of them. We want to help them. We want to love them and help them to learn how to make the right choices for themselves. You know, parents, sometimes we try so hard. Again, I, I talk about being on defense, but we really need to say, hey, I want to help you learn how to listen to music that's going to benefit your heart. I want to help you choose. I want to help you make the right choices for you. That's the ultimate goal, because then when they leave home, like two of our three kids have, they're making their own decisions now. You know, but we've trained them and the Bible says, train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that's not a promise in the Bible. It's in Proverbs, but it's, it's a, it's a truth that we, it's our job as parents to guide our children to the right things. But ultimately they do get to make the choices, but it's our responsibility. I like to say as fearless parents, as fearless parents, it's our responsibility to teach them the right way and to help them make the right choices. And so you see something good going on with Justin Bieber and, and well, so you're gonna, you're, let's, we're going to bring up Justin Bieber now. Yeah, I, <laughs> so, yeah. So there was a, a podcast, uh, Chelsea and Judah Smith. Judah Smith is a pastor in Seattle. And there was a podcast that Justin and Haley Bieber were a part of this past week. And it was picked up by the major news outlets. It was like People Magazine and Today Show and different things. They were reporting on this. And it was Haley Bieber saying that during the difficult seasons of their marriage, uh, they've been married, I think, for about three years. But Justin Bieber has gone through mental illness. He's had a lot of struggles. He went through a lot, obviously, as a child star, a lot of things. And when he got married, a lot of things he went through came to the surface, and it was really hard for them. But what it reported was, as, as Haley Bieber said, and the, uh, the headline said, she said, I'm going to stick it out. I've decided to stick it out with Justin through these hard times. And I love that being news. Like the young couple, like, and it's tough being a celebrity couple for these guys, but they're, they're saying, hey, we're going to stick it out. She stood by his side. They work together. Judah Smith and his wife that did the podcast, they're close friends. They've prayed with them. They've walked them through this. They talked about their journey of how they've supported Justin and Haley through this time. And I do think that that's news because it's important 
for us to fight for our marriages and it's important for us to fight for other marriages. You know, if you can come alongside another couple and, and this isn't a judgment on, on people that have gone through divorce. I come from a divorced home as well, you know, but I know there have been seasons where I wanted to give up and I saw God do a miracle in our marriage. My wife and I have been married now for 26 years. Our marriage is better than ever with our three kids. We have a close family, but it hasn't been with a lot of trial, without a lot of trial and struggle and fighting for our marriage and, and other people have come alongside and fought for us. And that's why we're here. And so I just think that's, a, that's an incredible story that, that needs to be shared. And I, I love that that was, that was in the headlines this week. That's a great headline. How did your wife handle it when you lost your hair? Was she okay? You know, she was just so thankful that I was a beautiful, bald man. You know what I mean? And we dated back in high school. And I, I had really cool hair back then. Okay? So that's the whole thing. I had, you know, I had, I had the rock star hair. Look, I had to, I had to you know, Bobby, Pastor Harrington, he keeps putting on weight. You know, his wife's like a rock star. Oh, yes, so I do know. I put a little pressure on him. Like, man, you, you don't lose some weight, man. You don't lose this rock star. Uh, I love it. What, last question. Okay. I'm going to let you go. All right. Uh, I saw where Kanye West had Marilyn Manson at his Sunday service. I think Justin Bieber was there as well. And I'm sympathetic towards celebrities that, because I think fame is one of the worst addictions. I think it's worse than drug addictions. Yeah. And I think it puts you through so much. And so I'm sympathetic towards Kanye and all these guys that try to tap into their faith to deal with all that comes along with being famous. Yeah. And so even someone like Marilyn Manson, who I think was involved with the Satanic Church years ago or whatever, when I see them take any step towards God, I tend to applaud rather than question. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I mean, with, with Kanye, I haven't listened to his new album very much. His last album was called Jesus is King. Yeah. I love that album. Somehow even worked, he had, it's worshipful and even worked in a song about Chick-fil-A closed on Sunday. So I respect that as a songwriter. But uh, so, yeah, I, I've been blessed by his music. Kanye's a true artist. I mean, he is creative, but his creativity, he just go, he's all over the place. But I mean, if, if you would have told me 10 years ago that Kanye was going to be having a Sunday morning service on Halloween and Marilyn Manson was going to be there, I would have thought, you're crazy to say that, right? But I don't think people are blowing up Marilyn Manson's phone to come to church. And so when I saw that headline, I'm like, and I, I know his music. I've read some of his lyrics. They're so dark. I mean, he lives in a dark place. And for him to be there singing songs about Jesus, hearing the, I hope he heard the gospel on Halloween. I hope there's a lot of things he could have been doing on Halloween. He was at church with Kanye. So, and I don't know the details of either of their well, lives, but I, I, I look at that again. I just try to look at the positive. I, I want people to hear the gospel. I know anybody that moves closer to Jesus. I mean, any parent, any kid, any individual and what Jesus did on the cross is enough for anybody. You look at the people that Jesus chose. I mean, he appeared to Saul in the Bible and he Saul was persecuting the church. He ended up radically changing his life. And, and then Paul wrote, became, Saul became Paul and wrote a third of the New Testament. And, and Jesus said about Paul, he said, he is my chosen instrument. And so I think it's important not to count people out. And I agree with you. It's important to have compassion for people that are in celebrity, that we give them a lot of grace because it's, it's a tough gig. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Bobby Harrington was right. You're, Thank you so much. You're one of the bright lights, and, and <laughs> I hope that parents are heeding your advice. All right, go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Hit that subscription. Hit the likes. Get those likes up to 4,000 for today's show. Uncle Jimmy and our approval rating on Winsome Sears. Hey! Time for our approval rating and Uncle Jimmy uh, joining us from home uh, via Skype. Uncle Jimmy, we covered a lot of ground and territory today. Uh, man, uh, really liked today's show. Did you follow the uh, election last night and the election coverage? 
Yes, I followed the election coverage. Yes, I did, and I enjoyed it. I loved, I loved it all. And we went to <laughs> last night. Went to show your boy Don Juan Williams that evidently he's wrong, and evidently we has people of color do actually care about our families and what goes on. <laughs> I, I think there's some truth in that. The guy. Uh, uh, Youngkin had improved turnout in, in virtually every district. And, and anyway, I, I enjoy, I thought uh, Leonidas and Shamika uh, did an awesome job. And I love this uh, minister, Jason Hauser. What did you think of Winsome Sears and her family and, and her acceptance speech? I loved it. I, I, I loved every minute of it. It, 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 yeah, it, you're it, an old it, Marine I mean, yourself. Oorah! <laughs> I'm a romping, stomping, ass-kicking, hell-raising piece of death and destruction. I love that, man, <laughs> honestly. It, 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 it just went to show that she was Marine Corps, Marine Corps fed, and she turned around and got grown and became Marine Corps bred. I mean, I love it. It's beautiful. It, uh, I, I yeah, love her and... I loved the family. I, I, I loved I loved everything that it represented. And I think that it you... also represented whether anybody realizes it or not. I think she won that race because a lot of people voted for her, not because of her political stance, but they voted on her, what she stood for as a person. And that's how she won that race. They voted on right and not for nothing else. Did you, have you seen the picture of her Holding an AR-15. <laughs> man, What's your take you. on that? Hey, man. Any woman that can handle the steel and still know her way around the kitchen. Woo! <laughs> now, that's a woman. You understand me? Yeah. <laughs> she can that's handle all. the steel, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, hey, but before we, but before we get, get to this proof rating, I got one problem with you, though. I got oh, go one ahead. problem with something you said today, man, and I, I can't let you get away with it. Hey, man, did you really say that Don Lemon couldn't get into the boom, boom room? <laughs> did you really say I did say not that? say he. <laughs> no, I, that's not what I said. Oh, okay, <laughs> I, I was getting ready to say. What did you say? Basically, I said... Ain't no black people in his boom boom room. <laughs> That's what I said. Okay, well, I thought you said he couldn't get into the boom room. I was boom boom room. I was gonna say he can get into the boom boom room. He just gotta come in from the rear. We're moving on to the approval rating uh, for Winsome Sears. Uh, Jimmy's uh, inappropriate backdoor joke uh, <laughs> is. Uh, <laughs> hey, man, we just had Tennessee Harmony. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm glad he gone. <laughs> <laughs> You just threw me all the way up. Uh, Winsome Sears, job performance. Uh, I'm going to give her a 20. Can't give her. I got to see her move into this lieutenant governor's deal and how she does there before I go all the way up to a 25. But she she won election, so I'm going to give her a 20 in job performance. And you know what? You and I are on the same page. She, she got to at least show up to work. I give her a 20. Uh, character. I'm going to, you know, I don't know all the details, so I'm not going to go perfect score. She's kind of new on the scene, so I'm going to give her a 24 with, a, you know, give her one, uh, take off one point just because she's kind of new to the scene and I don't know all the background. So not a perfect character score, but dang, dang close, 24. I don't see why you wouldn't give her a perfect character score. I don't see where you saw the flaw at. She gets a 25 from me. Mm. Uh, authenticity. 
Again, only because she's new to the scene, I don't give her a perfect score, but I give her a 23 for authenticity. Okay, let me ask you a question, and I want you to keep this real with me. When was yeah. the last time you seen a woman look that good and her hair looked that good and it wasn't a drop of weave in it? <laughs> that is true. I did think she, that I thought woman, she looked very good that last night. Woman rolls up her hair every night. That's a lost art amongst our women. <laughs> of taking care of your hair and rolling up your hair every night. She takes care of her hair. I love that. That's authentic. That's authentic. That's 20, something uh, from perfect our score. Got you. Uh, it factor, you know, I'm going 21. Uh, not quite perfect, but, you know, you know, I, I like tenderonis. Uh, you know, and, and I thought very good. Uh, 21, but uh, not, not quite perfect. 21, it factor. Uh, I don't know what you're looking at, but uh, for me, her, her, her it factor with me and everything I saw, I have no problem with anything. She came, she saw, she kicked their ass. That's what Marines do. She gets a 25, 23 from me. All right, I've got her at a smoke show, an 88 overall. Uh, you have her at blazing hot, 93. Uh, you might be right, Jim. Uh, you might be right. All right, that's tomorrow I hear in the background playing. That means we'll see you tomorrow. That's it, and that's all for us.